political scandals have existed for a while. But when exposed, they have followed a standard template, starting with denial of the scandal, followed by blatant attempts to suppress any investigations. And once convicted, an air of confidence around a presidential pardon. Welcome to the Why in History. I am Ajay Kaur and today we look at some of the major political scandals in US history, their origins, how they got exposed and the impact they had on democracy and governance. One of the earliest political scandals in the United States was the Credit Mobilier scandal of 1872 to 73. The interesting part of this scandal was that there were a number of US congressmen that faced scrutiny, but besides them, the US vice president was involved as well. In July of 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed into law the Pacific Railroads Act of 1862, which authorized extensive grants of land and issuance of government bonds to the Union Pacific Railroad and Central Pacific Railroad companies for the construction of a transcontinental railroad, meaning a railroad connecting the east and the west coasts of the United States. Under the Act, the Union Pacific Railroad was provided $100 million, which would be approximately $1.6 billion today. This was provided in initial capital investment to build the portion of the railroad running from the Missouri River to the Pacific Coast. And the Union Pacific also received land grants and government loans, totaling up to $60 million to cover the laying of the tracks. The railroad executives realized that they could make a lot of money from this project. So the Union Pacific executive, Thomas C. Durant, created a fictitious railroad construction company, which he called Credit Mobilier of America, which made it appear that it was associated with the French bank Credit Mobilier, which it was not. Durant created Credit Mobilier to inflate Union Pacific's railroad construction costs. The construction costs never exceeded about $50 million, but Credit Mobilier billed the federal government for $94 million, and the Union Pacific executives pocketed the $44 million. And to prevent any federal intervention, Durant approached U.S. Representative Oak Ames to help bribe several members of Congress with cash and stock options. And in return, the bribed lawmakers promised Durant that there would be no federal oversight of either Union Pacific or Credit Mobilier. In September of 1872, the New York Sun published an expose of the scandal, naming the congressmen involved. And this happened in the thick of President Ulysses S. Grant's re-election campaign. There was a lot of public outrage, and this led to two House committees and one Senate committee being set up in December of 1872 to investigate the 13 congressmen named in the scandal. In the end, Representatives Oakes Ames and James Brooks were censured for using political influence for personal financial gain, while the rest, including Vice President Colfax, were absolved of any wrongdoing. Vice President Colfax, though, was replaced by Senator Henry Wilson as President Grant's running mate in the 1872 elections, and the Grant-Wilson ticket did win the presidential election in 1872. Another representative, James A. Garfield, who had been named in the scandal, went on to become president in 1880. The only significant impact of the scandal, though, was that President Grant ordered the removal of Thomas Durant 
as the director of Union Pacific. Moving from railroads to oil, the Teapot Dome scandal of 1921 through 24 had some commonalities with the Credit Mobilier scandal. The oil reserves at Teapot Dome and in California had been set aside at the request of the US Navy, which had been converting coal fuel ships into oil powered vessels since 1909. So as more ships converted to run on oil, Navy officials wanted to ensure that there was enough oil at hand in the event of a war or other emergency. So under President William Howard Taft, Congress began to set aside federal lands believed to contain oil as emergency reserves. In 1920, Senator Warren G. Harding won a long shot bid for the White House with the financial backing of oil men. In return, he promised a very oil friendly cabinet. In 1921, Senator Albert Fall from New Mexico was appointed as Secretary of the Interior by President Harding. And immediately after, Albert Fall convinced the president to hand over the oversight of the petroleum reserves from the Navy to his interior department. And once the transfer was complete, Albert Fall started secret negotiations with two of his wealthy friends in the oil industry. And in 1922, with no competitive bidding or any public announcement, Albert Fall leased exclusive drilling rights to the entire Teapot Dome site to the Mammoth Oil Company, which was owned by his friend Harry Sinclair. The Teapot Dome site was the oil-rich land next to a teapot-shaped outcrop in Wyoming. And the two oil reserves in California were leased to Pan American Petroleum Company, which was owned by Edward Doheny, who too was a friend of Albert Fall. Now, all in all, the three sites were estimated to contain hundreds of millions of dollars worth of high-grade petroleum. Since the deals had been all hush-hush, in April of 1922, the word got out that there was something shady going on here when local Wyoming oilmen Notice trucks with the Sinclair logo hauling oil field equipment up to the teapot dome. And soon after that, the Wall Street Journal broke the news about the deal. The very next day, Wyoming Democratic Senator John Kendrick introduced a resolution to open a Senate investigation into these dealings. In January of 1923, Albert Fall stepped down as Interior Secretary to enjoy time on his newly purchased ranch in New Mexico and also to participate in lucrative oil deals in Mexico and the Soviet Union on behalf of Doheny and Sinclair. The Senate investigations, though, continued in the meantime. President Harding, on his own, was feeling the weight of the investigations and the possible corruption charges around Albert Fall. He's supposed to have asked his Commerce Secretary and future President, Herbert Hoover, if you knew of a great scandal in your administration, would you, for the good of the country and the party, expose it publicly or would you bury it? Hoover is supposed to have advised him to expose it but Harding declined because he was worried about the political repercussions. On August the 2nd, 1923, President Harding died of a stroke at age 57 in San Francisco. Subsequently, under the new leadership of President Calvin Coolidge, two special prosecutors, one Democrat and one Republican, were appointed to take over the Senate investigation into Albert Falls oil deals. The investigation revealed that Albert Fall had received $100,000 interest-free loan from Doheny 
to purchase land for his enormous New Mexico ranch. From the other oilman Sinclair, Fall had received a large herd of livestock for his ranch, along with $300,000 in Liberty bonds and cash to his son-in-law. Finally, in the fall of 1929, more than six years after the exposure of the scandal, Albert Fall was convicted of accepting a bribe from Doheny and fined $100,000 and sentenced to one year in prison. The fine against Fall was eventually waived because he had lost most of his wealth and Doheny had foreclosed on his New Mexico ranch. But Albert Fall did end up serving nine months in jail before being released due to failing health. He died in 1944 after a long illness. The Supreme Court voided the oil leases and in 1927, production was halted at both the Teapot Dome and the California sites. A secret arms deal that almost threatened to bring down the presidency of Ronald Reagan was the Iran-Contra affair. And what is interesting about this scandal is that it follows the template I mentioned at the beginning of the program to the teeth. President Ronald Reagan won the White House in 1980, but he wasn't able to maintain his political momentum as the Democrats swept to majority in both the Senate and the House of Representatives in the 1982 midterm elections. Soon after taking control of Congress, the Democrats passed the Boland Amendment, which restricted the activities of the CIA and the Department of Defense in foreign conflicts. The amendment was specifically aimed at Nicaragua, where the anti-communist Contras were battling the communist Sandinista government. Ronald Reagan had a soft corner towards the Contras, but a lot of their funding up to that point was coming from Nicaragua's cocaine trade. And that was one of the primary reasons why Congress passed the Boland Amendment. But still, President Reagan instructed his national security advisor, Robert McFarlane, to find a way around the Boland Amendment and assist the Contras. Meanwhile, around the same time, the Middle East was engaged in a bloody conflict between Iran and Iraq, and the Iranian-backed Hezbollah were holding hostage seven Americans, diplomats and private contractors, in Lebanon. And President Reagan wanted to find a way to bring these hostages home. And in 1985, Robert McFarlane informed Ronald Reagan that Iran had approached the United States about purchasing weapons for its war against Iraq. Wait, hadn't the US imposed a trade embargo on Iran after 52 American hostages had been held for 444 days after the Ayatollah Khomeini came to power in Iran? Yep, that is true. And that is the reason Secretary of State George Shultz and Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger were against this proposal from Robert McFarlane. McFarlane agreed with George Shultz and Caspar Weinberger, but he counter-argued that going forward with this deal would help the United States improve its relations in that area, especially with Lebanon. But more importantly, the arms deal would secure funds that the CIA could funnel to the Contras in Nicaragua. McFarlane was backed by CIA Director William Casey and Ronald Reagan decided to bless the deal. And once again, it was a newspaper, this time Lebanese newspaper, al Shira, which reported the arms deal between the United States and Iran in 1986, when President Reagan was well into his second term. By that time, 1,500 American missiles had been sold to Iran for $30 million. 
three of the seven hostages in Lebanon had been released, although the group later took three more Americans hostage. President Reagan initially denied that he had negotiated with Iran or the terrorists, only to retract that statement a week later. Attorney General Edwin Meese launched an investigation into the weapons deal and found that $18 million out of the $30 million that Iran had paid for was still unaccounted for. And it was then that Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North of the National Security Council came forward to acknowledge that the missing $18 million had been diverted to the Contras in Nicaragua. And Oliver North said that he had done this with full knowledge of the National Security Advisor, Admiral John Poindexter, and he assumed that President Reagan was also aware of this. There was a major uproar following this, and President Reagan appointed the Tower Commission, led by Texas Republican Senator John Tower, to investigate the administration's involvement in the Iran-Contra affair. And as expected, it concluded that President Reagan's lack of oversight enabled those working under him to divert the funds to the Contras. There was a subsequent congressional investigation, and in 1987, several of the participants in the scandal, including President Reagan, testified before the commission, and these hearings were televised nationally. Later, independent counsel Lawrence Walsh launched an eight-year investigation into the matter, and all in all, 14 people were charged, including Oliver North, Admiral John Poindexter, and National Security Advisor Robert McFarlane. President Reagan himself was never charged, and in 1992, then President George H.W. Bush, who was Reagan's vice president during the Iran-Contra affair, preemptively pardoned Caspar Weinberger. But despite several of the participants being found guilty of charges ranging from conspiracy to perjury to fraud, only one, a private contractor, Thomas Kleins, ultimately served time in prison. President Reagan himself acknowledged that selling arms to Iran was a mistake during his testimony before Congress. One scandal where the guilty were actually impacted to some extent was the app scam of 1978 through 1980. In February of 1978, the FBI enlisted Melvin Weinberg, a con artist, to aid in the recovery of stolen paintings. Weinberg was facing a three-year prison term for running a fraudulent real estate scheme, and he saw his sentence reduced to probation after agreeing to help the FBI. By July 1978, Weinberg was posing as the U.S. representative for Abdul Enterprises, a fictitious company, and he was soliciting stolen securities and forged certificates of deposit in the name of Kambir Abdul Rahman, again, a fictitious Arab sheikh. And it was the fictitious Abdul Enterprises that gave the AB scam its name. So while Weinberg was conning untapped oil riches, the FBI agents were assuming the role of sheikhs, and between the two, they were sweeping up a growing circle of middlemen, fraudsters, and white-collar criminals. But this FBI undercover investigation changed abruptly in December of 1978 when Weinberg met with Angelo Ericetti, the mayor of Camden, New Jersey. Ericetti was also a state senator and offered to guarantee approval of a casino gaming license for Abdul Enterprises in exchange for $400,000. He also 
provided a list of other politicians who he believed would be susceptible to bribes. And as a result, Abscam's focus shifted to political corruption. And over the next one year, the FBI videotaped a series of meetings with politicians to uncover corruption at different levels. Officials such as U.S. Representatives Raymond Lederer and Michael Myers of Pennsylvania promised to ease the Sheikh's immigration troubles in exchange for cash. Senator Harrison Williams Jr. of New Jersey offered to assist Abscam's second fictional Sheikh, Yasser Habib, in return for the promise of a multi-million dollar investment in a titanium mine in which Harrison Williams held a financial interest. In February 1980, while the operation was still in progress, word of its existence was leaked to the press. And subsequently, the government obtained 19 convictions on charges that included bribery, extortion and conspiracy. The Senate Select Committee on Ethics ruled that Senator Williams' conduct was ethically repugnant. Williams resigned before an expulsion vote could be held. Of the six representatives who were convicted, two resigned, three were defeated in re-election bids, and one, Michael Myers, was expelled by the House. So here, Congress did act quickly to discipline its members. But it also worked to ensure that such a wide-ranging probe was subject to far greater oversight in the future. Attorney General Benjamin Civiletti issued new, stricter guidelines for FBI undercover operations in January of 1981. And it is here that we end this section of the program with a promise to cover the mother of all scandals, the Watergate scandal, on its own in a different episode. On to the quiz section. Question from the previous episode. Which country has not yet signed the UNCLOS or the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea? The United States believes that some of the provisions of the UNCLOS Treaty are not free market friendly and are designed to favor the economic systems of the communist states. And as a result, it is yet to sign the UNCLOS. So the answer is C the United States. Question for the current episode. Which US presidential candidate was once the prime accused in the Keating Five scandal of 1989? Five US senators were accused of improperly intervening in 1987 on behalf of Charles Keating Jr., the chairman of the Lincoln Savings and Loan Association, which was the target of a regulatory investigation. So was it A, John McCain, B, Hillary Clinton, C, Mitt Romney, or D, John Kerry? Once again, which US presidential candidate was once the prime accused in the Keating Five scandal of 1989? Was it A, John McCain, B, Hillary Clinton, C, Mitt Romney, or D, John Kerry? The answer will be provided in the next episode. That's all we have in the current episode. In the next episode, we look at one of the long and bloody conflicts in the Middle East, which lasted eight long years and had an impact on the political and economic landscape within the Middle East. I'm talking about the Iran-Iraq War of 1980. Till then, stay safe and keep looking for the why in history.